Pierre, thank you very much for doing this. The book, um, small things like these, I think for many readers will, um, when, will, will hit against the notion of the art of reading because um, I opened this book and I found myself reading it and being taken over by it, being fully convinced by it and being so absorbed by it that I didn't think that I let the, I let the emotions of the novel hit me. It, it was as though it, the novel had bypassed any sort of critical um, capacity and moved into some other area, which was emotional, which was the nervous system, which that strange business of being taken in, taken over, taken in, taken over, taken up by a book. I think like a lot of people then, I have reread the book. And so it's in the rereading, I really want to uh, ask you some questions and make some comments. I suppose the first one arises from the notion of the particular and the universal as to, um, this is a very particular place in your Ross in this particular year. There's a moment in the book where you talk about someone coming with an Enniscorthy accent. And what's interesting is that people might say, how could an Enniscorthy accent be a different accent in New Ross, which is just 20 miles away or less, in fact. And the answer is absolutely that there is an Enniscorthy accent, it's intact. And that the people in this novel speak in a very particular way, sometimes, there's an inversion of, of a phrase as in a translation from the Irish. If they're talking familiarly to someone they know, other times they're more formal. The dialogue is, 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 is intricate. Um, but the idea of New Ross itself, the river, the different factories, Albatross, uh, Murphy Floods Hotel, and then Escorthy, the sort of things that are in the windows, Quality Street chocolates, and the whole sense of an exact moment in an exact place. And it's out of that particular way of being exact that something rises, that it isn't merely local or parochial or provincial, that something arises from that particularity that, that actually speaks to the world. And um, I suppose the question is um, that, for any Scorthy people, certain, New Ross is almost a foreign country. The people know Gory better than New Ross that New Ross is almost Waterford. Is that right? Yeah. Sorry. Yes, I, th I think people do associate uh, New Ross with Waterford. It's, uh, it's where you pass over the bridge. It's where you cross the barrow to get to, get to Waterford. Um, and, and for me, it's, uh, it's it's a strange town to, in, in some ways because it is on, on, on that border and has this beautiful dark river flowing through it. And to me, I, I also associate it with, with some coal smoke, which to me was quite an exotic thing when I was growing up because we couldn't afford coal. We had, we had sticks, we had logs. Um, but going back to, to your question about how you know, how do you get the universal out of the particular? I don't, I don't see myself being able to do it in any other way. Because if you, if you don't have the particular, you won't have a picture. And if you don't have a picture, I don't think it's possible to take a reader there. I certainly am not one of, one of the readers who is taken along by, by a story which isn't visual. And I need those particulars, what I call authenticating details, in order to be taken in and to be taken there. And then I, I, I feel assured that I'm in good hands. Um, and, th and then I will go along with, with what happens. But I also like them to hide, uh, if you want to call them the bigger issues. Um, I, I like them to... I like those to be concealed within what is what is particular, um, rather rather than to feel in the presence of of a story that preaches to you. Those particularities um, include, I think, the most intimate sounds and sights. For example, he's filling hot water bottles. So um, Furlong rose then and filled the electric kettle to make up their hot water bottles. When it came up to a boil, he filled the first two. Now watch this, pushing the air from each out in a rubbery little wheeze before twisting the caps on tight. And um, 
then there's a moment very soon afterwards where um, it, it's getting night and the rain had come on again, was blowing hard against the window pane, making the curtain move. Now this, this, from inside the cooker, he heard a lump of anthracite collapsing against another and put a little more on. And what, I'm, what I would suggest about those two details is it is not merely that, there vis that, that, that there's a sound in, in one, the anthracite, in the other, it, it's visual. And in both it's particular, in, in, in both the robbery these give you a sense anyone has ever done that, get the air out of a, a water bottle, but also they, they bring with them a sort of resonance, a sort of funny thing about objects, about the, the way, just the way that's described. I suppose Joyce would call it epiphany, um, but that it isn't merely a particularity. It has some resonance or some lift in it that actually by, by hearing it, by seeing it, a, an emotion comes with that, which is, which is very, very hard to define. As, as you can see, I'm just struggling, but, but is nonetheless vital in, in keeping the reader not only convinced, but emotionally engaged in somehow or other in this atmosphere you've made. Well, I, I think probably it may have to do, it may have to do with they're being connected to heat because it is a winter story and it's a it's a very cold wet winter and in the first case he's making up the um the hot water bottles for the girls and then in the second there's the anthracite collapsing against the other and the draft coming in the feeling of the cold coming in again and one, one of the things i I, I used to feel afraid of when I started writing was reusing what I had chosen. And now I really rely on reusing what I've chosen that you choose, you try and choose well, which I think is very difficult at the beginning. You don't know what you're doing at the beginning. At least I, I certainly don't. Um, and then when, when you have made a decision um, or a commitment, at least for, for a time, a period of time, and you're going to try that particular point of view or that time. Um, I, I think then uh, it's very interesting to, to just reuse uh, the cold um, and, and to reassure uh, the reader that what they thought was true, what they thought was true is actually true, and that you go in rather than going on. No, I think I think bad storytellers, bad conversationalists go on and on. I always think of Larkin who said, why did people think adding was increase? To me, it was dilution. And in, instead of going in then, more is added. And, and I really do, I do try not to add more, but to go in farther in, into what I've chosen, if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. What I'm trying to circle around is an idea that, that the novel is, is a breach of a concept that the novel is a secular space. In other words, that our job as novelists is to make things and is to have objects and people who are in search of some sort of happiness on earth that will be helped with money, with good luck, with maybe coincidence, and that people facing their destiny face their destiny in a material world and that the novel rose in a time when people got more chances and when choices could be made by many more people and that um, what people were seeking was um, love leading to marriage but marriage itself being um, a, a place of comfort or material ease and um, to try and introduce a religious tone or a spiritual tone or a non-material tone into a novel requires a great deal of very, very careful work. Uh, the, the reader seems to me to resist it and um, to actually, if, if, you, I mean, if you had somebody praying for something and that thing arise, ar arriving in the next episode, you would feel, well, this is not a novel, that the, the novel loves disappointment. The novel loves people, someone praying for something and then not getting it or even forgetting later what they had in fact had prayed for. And um, that, that it isn't good on miracles and it isn't good on the soul. That when the soul is used in a novel, you have to be very, very careful to use, to use that word sparingly. Henry James uses it very, very carefully and very, very seldom. But um, I suppose what I'm coming to is the idea that Furlong is on a spiritual journey. 
and that this is a, and that this is, and that this is a novel about a very unusual thing in in fiction, and I think so unusual in Irish fiction that I would have trouble thinking of another one, and that's the idea of a good man, and. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, the country is filled with them. I mean, it's not as though we don't have good men. <laughs> good fathers and good uncles and good brothers and good sons. But actually, when you look through, <laughs> Simon Dedalus isn't a great help in this. Even Leopold Bloom himself, you know, that, that you just go through the body of Irish fiction. I mean, you go through John McGarhan, for example, and you have this extraordinary father going right through from the, from the barracks right through to... Um, to amongst women and um you have broken a mold i mean i mean part of the reason why i was so engrossed in this was no is he going to get drunk no is he going to do something funny you know he he for example he chooses the people he work who work with him obviously very carefully he likes them he gets on with them there's an ease in that relationship he loves his daughter. So there's a beautiful Claire, there's a beautiful moment when the, the youngest daughter is um, just shy of Santa Claus. She just doesn't want, she just wants to hold on to him. And you know, that's fine. And his wife thinks that's fine, but he doesn't. He no, that, will she be all right in the world? You know, he, he'll protect her in that moment. And the other girls have gone and they're excited, and she's not. And you get this moment where he has this fatherly love for her and wanting to protect her and there's nothing else involved it's it's it, it's it's not it's not just visceral it's kind i mean it's you know it's it's his nature is a kind nature and um it's a very difficult thing to do because the reader is waiting for in, in irish fiction and irish theater is worse they're always waiting for a man to shout <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what, I, what i'm wondering is i suppose i'm wondering how conscious were you of, of making Furlong so that he wouldn't fulfill your expectations to be, to be in some way or other a problematic figure? Well, I'm, I'm really not that clever in, in the sense of thinking consciously about that or plotting it or... Um, I, I feel as a writer that I'm more a servant than squire, and that my job is to listen and to try and follow what is there and listen for what is there and discover it and put it down as evenly as possible without exaggeration. And, and to not ask the central character to bear any of my preoccupations. Because I, I suppose I think if you're I rely, I, I rely on my belief that if you're thoughtful, your thoughtfulness will somehow come out in the prose and, and that you don't have to really make decisions about it as you go along if you, if you can find a, a central character who will be the vehicle for something you, you may or may not want to say. Again, I think whether or not you want to say it is neither here nor there. The imagination comes out uh, to meet the brave. So, so with with Furlong, um, like you, there were moments there were, there were moments when I thought he would notice, and I think in one draft I did have him noticing the smell of alcohol when he passed the pub at Christmas. But then it just didn't sound right. It didn't. It didn't feel like it belonged to his point of view, and uh, and he he just wasn't a, wasn't a drinker. But even though it may seem to be the heroic, the story of an heroic kind man, I think it's also the story of a man breaking down. I think I think this is the story of a middle aged a man who is almost middle-aged, he's 39 years old, breaking down, and that he has carried gracefully what he has carried quietly all through his life, and that somehow now what he has had to bear, um, that, that the furnace of the 1980s, Catholicism in 1980s, and the, the depression and the backwardness, and the cold, wet winter, 
has somehow brought him to this place where he's no longer too able to carry on, no longer to carry on as ably as he was, and that he's stumbling emotionally, and that, that this is actually an account of a man's breaking down. And I, I believe the ending could be interpreted as an act of self-destruction. Um, I think readers, well, there must be readers who will connect this novel to James Joyce's The Dead. And I'm not sure, my hunch would be that you, that you didn't do this when you were working, you didn't think about that. I just want to put a few things into your head. I think the, I, the, the idea of ritual in that story and the idea of ritual in your novel, for example, the making of the Christmas cake, which might seem just, just, a, just an ordinary thing again. We're talking about that idea of putting a glow around ordinary things so that they seem to shimmer on the page or do something emotional way beyond their, 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 their mere function as description. The creation of the Christmas cake, um, say, or the, or the description of all the things that are in the windows as he's walking through the town, that, 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 um, that all of those things create in him a sort of sense of belonging, of ritual, of, of year in, year out. But there's a ghost of Michael Fury um, in your book too, which is of course the ghost of his mother and the ghost ghost, the double ghost of his father, missing from the ritual. So that as he's with his daughter, there's a wonderful moment where you know, his wife just said, some, you're thinking about something else this evening. And of course, he can't share with her in exactly the same way as Greta and Gabriel have not been able to share. She's not been able to share with him the, the, the ghost of Michael Fury. But in this ritual season, what the, what, what the story can do is find someone that's not contained in the ritual. And then they come in as ghost, as uneasy presence, as, uh, as a sort of haunting. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, yes, it does, and it's it's so interesting that you you compare the two stories. But I mean, Greta in in the Dead does does tell Gabriel about about Michael Fury, and and um, and she does get it off her chest. Whereas whereas Furlong is somebody who doesn't he doesn't he doesn't say anything. And I think that that is part of his part of his burden is that he he doesn't talk about what he's carried. So to, so to that extent, um, his inarticulacy becomes an important thing in, in the story, that, that it isn't as though he's not garrulous. He's not a storyteller. He's someone people, people trust because of his, in a way, silences that, that you know, he delivers on time rather than telling you he'll deliver on time. And um, yes, and and that, sorry? Yes, and I, I, I don't see that though as being ar inarticulate. I, I see it as part of his um, loneliness, that he is in, unable to speak of it. But I, I suppose what I mean is that around the town, he's not known as a sort of a hail fellow well met, that he's solid rather than a, rather than a talker. I mean, you know the way in Wexford, in a Wexford town, someone who talks too much would be slightly would be laughed at or despised in some way but someone who just sits there um has a different role yes but he he's not he's neither i would argue that he's neither one or the other simply because he, he can't sit still he's not able to even sit still after after he gets his sunday dinner and that's how i uh, i knew he wasn't all right um, because he he wasn't able to sit in peace, even though even after earning it after a week of hard work and heavy lifting, he he wasn't able, and he has difficulty sleeping through the night also, and um, and those are the things I rely on because I think we're first of all physical, and it's the the physicality of the life I rely on to find the details of the emotional state. And then when you have the emotional state set in a social background, you're able to say something about the society and how the society then may have produced that in the human being and, and in the family and in the home. Um, um, it, it's very difficult for novelists to write about work, um, basically because if you're writing novels all day, it's not as though your knowledge of actually how say working in creating software or 
doing things that most people do in Ireland now who have work. And um, novelists, novelists are bad on this. And, um, you know, I found that my mother worked as a bookkeeper and she, I know all about totting and I know all about, you know, invoice and reconciling. And I, I, I put that in a few books, but it's very difficult and um, to imagine another person's work. Now, it's an absolutely inspired idea. In 1985, in a place like New Ross, in a time of economic downturn, and this is when the idea of having oil-centered heating would, would be such a luxury that most people wouldn't even think about it. And then you have this business of the open fire, which is, you know, and the fact that people are living in the countryside. How do you get coal and turf? And how do you get briquettes and anthracite? So that his, um, his job gives him access to so many things and allows him to, you know, travel everywhere. He, he, he can go in front doors and back doors. He's welcome everywhere he goes. His, his, the job is, is an essential, I mean, really it's inspired Claire that he, he does this. And, you know, any writer is gonna read this and say, oh God, I wish I thought of that because it really allows him. I mean, it's almost like, you see, he's almost like a priest in that he has access to everyone's house and he's moving all day from one place to another, like a mm -hmm. doctor. Except it's probably even more well. Yes, sorry? I'm sorry, Colm, there was a, a little bit of a glitch in, in the sound. I, okay. yes, and he's, ex he's expected. He's expected in, uh, in the houses and, and they're looking for him. And if he doesn't come, he's missed, even though it may, it may not be he himself, um, you know, but, but what he brings. But still, I, I, think that, I think that's fascinating that you see him as um, almost a, a, a priestly figure going, going from house to house. Or a doctor. Mm. Um, you talked earlier about the notion of self-suppression um, being necessary for a writer. In other words, I always say, ask, like, why do you write journalism? I said, well, very simple, to get all that poison out of myself so that I don't have any need for it. If I'm writing a story or a novel, I, I can actually hold back from, you know, putting in things that I, might be things I should be writing as, as an op-ed piece or an editorial or something. And um, I think what you do in the book is you give his wife a great amount of power in, in, in that her saying, don't stop giving money to people, you know, stop being the sort of, um, you know, be very, very careful that our, our life is precarious. And indeed the way the woman who, who you know, um, Mrs. Kyo speaks, but the way Mrs. Kill speaks is different. She's, she's much more intrusive in the way she comes in with the argument. Whereas the wife is much quieter in her insistence on don't get involved with this. You know? And the reader, what's interesting what you've done is you, the reader realizes the real dangers of this. He has daughters, uh, you know, some are in the convent already. Others will be going to the convent. Eventually he might have you know, three or four children all in the convent. And of course it's a different convent, but as someone, as Mrs. Kill says, they're all in this together. And the reader really fears for him because um, getting involved, even to the extent he's got involved early in the story, is, is, is really dangerous in that small community and will mark his daughters. So that you end up seeing it, and what I'm saying is you end up seeing it from his wife's point of view, even though you don't give her point of view a lot of, of uh, um, space in the book, you, but you give it enough space to make it really matter. Well, I think it's very difficult if if you're under financial pressure and you have five children in a time in 1985 Ireland. Um, and I think it's very, very difficult to be married to a soft hearted man who will give away the change out of his pocket. And yes. uh, it could be, it could be the difference between having enough and not having enough. At the end of the week. So that's where that's her position, and and she's she's got to she's she's got to take that into consideration and and keep an eye on him and keep him in check sometimes. And I suppose the question then is, um, 
does this come to you? I mean, it couldn't really, could it come to you as a single way that you're going to proceed before you start the novel? In other words, is this something that occurs to you gradually as you're working? I'd better do something else here. I'd better give a wife more power in this story than she has, because if I don't, I mean, is that how you work by, by adding, subtracting and editing? I, I don't think I would use the personal pronoun when, when, I'm, when I'm working. I really try and forget about myself completely when I'm working. And I, I'd be asking myself, well, for, for example, there's a, there's a scene in, in, when I was drafting the scene, he goes into the shoe shop and I knew the woman in the shoe shop didn't like him. I knew by the way she spoke to him that she didn't like him. And I had no understanding at that stage as to why not. But I just saw it as the work that you do to find out why the shopkeeper didn't, why the, the lady in, in the shoe shop didn't like him, that that's the work you do. Because she authentically didn't like him. I knew it was suggested on in the prose. And the one thing I really trust in prose is suggestion. If I find something working on a level of suggestion, I know it's true. It's always true. So that that was that piece of work and then um, another for example was i i just didn't know why he kept looking at the ground and then i thought well isn't that something that somebody who's been bullied does you go around looking at the ground instead of looking up and he wasn't observant and he wasn't nosy um, and he wasn't really engaged with other people he just happened to see what he happened to see so i I felt then that maybe he'd been bullied at school and then I put it all together and and I realized that maybe he was bullied um, because his mother wasn't married and maybe then that was something he had to carry all his life that some people would never like him uh, and would never have a regard for him and see him for who he was because he himself actually didn't know who he was in, in the way he was brought up. Um, there's a wonderful scene in the book where he drives and in his own territory, in his own terrain, gets oddly lost. And of course, this really is something that happens on, on those roads. I mean, if you try and drive towards Wexford and from your Ross and then turn off towards Enniscorthy, you can get really badly lost in that particular stretch. But he's getting lost is, is, is wonderfully done by you because it seems to me utterly physical and credible. He just simply is thinking about something else and he makes various turns and then he thinks he'd be able to make his way back around. So this is actually real. This is not you trying to find a metaphor, trying to move into a sort of terrain, which is, which is let's say, a dream world or a, you know, or a spiritual terrain he's moved into. And yet, and yet, and yet, he meets a figure. And that figure doesn't say anything of particular importance to him. He just says, well, this road will take you wherever you want to go. But it's something someone could say locally if you stop somebody on one of those roads. But it has wonderful resonance because it's rooted. And the resonance is that somehow or other, this experience of seeing the girl has brought him into a terrain that he has been avoiding, um, confronting or, or communicating and he doesn't know what to do with the jet. It, 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 it is as though it frightens him and, and it puts him really where he, the very thing he should know, which are these roads, he ceases to know. And he meets a figure who stays in his mind as a, as a curious figure in fiction, who's not needed in the story, who doesn't appear again, who simply comes in once to say one thing. And it, it's all over the Bible. I mean, it, and, it's, and it's, it's all over all sorts of things. There's always one strange moment that isn't in the pattern, but it actually makes a difference. And what, I, what I'm asking, I suppose, if, if, if this is, a, could you come to the question? The question is um, that notion of rootedness and of, of letting the rootedness do the work. Is that what you're talking about when you say suggestion? That in other words, if you just simply think, okay, yes, is he going to go home now? 
no, it's too early for him to go home. I need him to do something else. And then you start to write. And it's the writing itself leads you to the road and leads you to the figure rather than say, thinking it and then writing it. Yes. Yes, without, without question, I, I rely on what is physical to find the truth about the emotional state. And I believe that we think what we think because we feel what we feel, not the other way around. And so, so when, you, and when you're working, you follow that. In other words, you see where this next sentence will lead you using instinct. Yes, and, and relying on what is physically plausible at that time in that place for, for that point of view, in, in that point of view. And I, I never think about symbols because they're everywhere. And I don't look for metaphors because they'll naturally surface. If you're in the right place, you'll just wind up in, on, a, on a road with fog. And the fog, well, it certainly wasn't meant to be um, anything clever. It, it just happened to be on the road that night. And that's, that's how he, he lost his way and, and, couldn't, and couldn't see clearly. Um, when he sees the girl, um, there's a moment, I mean, I mean, it's beautifully described where, um, I mean, it really is an extraordinary piece of writing where, he, you know, he sees her. Um, uh, yes. Um, he couldn't properly see and was obliged to go back to the lorry for the torch. When he shone it on what was there, I mean, that's really beautiful. He judged by what was on the floor that the girl within had been there for longer than the night. And um, that is how, in, in other words, if I were writing that, um, I might have said, he couldn't probably seem as obliged to go back to the lorry for the torch. When he shone the torch, he found there was a girl and then go into the girl. But what you're doing is, no, no, he's already seen that. It, it's, it's, he's thinking, what is it now? Like he's trying to, inter he's, he's interpreting it the minute he sees it, which I think is a brilliant stroke. Instead of trying to over dramatize the sight of her, it's his immediate curiosity, what is going on here? And uh, I think there, um, I suppose there's a question I would ask about that is how much rewriting do you do? I mean, how much do you, with, with that, it's a particularly important moment because it's a drama, you know, he, he really is to be startled by this. But instead of, we sort of know he's startled, but instead of telling us he's startled, you, you, you do one other thing, you bring it below that into sort of a, his, his effort to make sense of this. What I'm wondering is, does, does it, though, do those few sentences then require a huge amount of rewriting or do they come? I, I don't remember exactly how much time I, I spent writing writing that scene, um, but I do I do an awful lot of rewriting, and I've I've so many drafts of of this book. I mean, they're um, probably from my waist to my head. If you put them one on top of the other, sing you know single side, double spaced. Um, what you say about dramatizing, I, I really think that narrative feeds on tension. Um, and tension always comes from loss. Drama doesn't always come from loss. Drama just can, can just come from drama. It can come from somebody who's, who's really boring being dramatic and it's tedious and dull. We've all seen hugely dramatic things on TV and, and, and they're just so dull. But tension, I think, is dull because it is, it is hitched onto, organically hitched onto loss and physical loss. And, and if you, and, and in this case of seeing something which you will never be able to unsee, that's, that's no longer a possibility for him to, to go back to the time before, before he saw this. So, so I actually think that if drama and tension were two people at a party. The tension when, when she saw a drama coming into the room would want to leave the party. <laughs> because, because one, they actually, it, the tension is actually reviled, but just 
there's something repulsive about drama to tension because drama just wants to take over and be loud and tension is the opposite mm -hmm. tension is what shines the light on what experiments she'd had to make there and realizing that how long she's been in the shed and not actually wanting to see the girl because it is too much um, I, I, I was drama wants to shine the light on the girl Sorry, whereas drama wants to shine the light on the girl. I, I was talking at the very beginning about the idea of um, being absorbed by this novel so that you didn't you know, think when you were reading it. Um, on rereading it, what, what I'm looking at now is your, your extraordinary intelligence, which may be a sort of tact, um, but, it's not, it, but it's not something that can come naturally, I think, to a writer, as much as it can come to a writer only after a lot of thinking about how fiction works. And I suppose I, it made me th realize, I think you have been teaching quite a lot and I think you've been talking quite a lot to serious people about how fiction is made. And I'm wondering if, if could help you, it could have helped you in doing something so intelligent. I mean, I mean just so rich with intelligence. Um, towards the end of the book, when he's in the convent and he's in two minds, First of all, he doesn't want to be in the room with that nun, with the, with the Reverend Mother. And then he sort of does. Then he sort of wants to string this out because he's not going to go as quickly as she wants him to go. He becomes stubborn for a second, but he isn't before. He's slightly, he's uneasy, and now he's stubborn. And so too, as he's at, in the very last scene, this, this, this beautiful last scene of the book, um, he isn't sure. He, he, it would be so easy to have made him suddenly brave or suddenly angry. Uh, and um, this, you know, sort of father courage figure. Instead, he's uneasy. With each person he meets, he registers unease and he's uneasy about what's going to happen. I, I, I find that so moving, the way his mind is investigated by you and dramatized. And it's not, never a single thing. His response is rich. So I, I suppose if there's a question, it is, um, has thinking about fiction, helped you? I think teaching fiction has helped me hugely because I've read so many manuscripts. I've been teaching creative writing on a part-time basis now for 25 years. And it's not, it's not enough to, to read a piece of uh, a manuscript, a draft, and, and say, I don't like this. And that's just a reaction. And, and of course, you need to provide a, you need to provide a, a response, a helpful response. And so I had to make myself go over manuscripts I would never have read had I not been paid to read them um, and, and make myself articulate why these pieces of fiction did not work and exactly why they did not work and what needed to happen to make them work. And I think that really led me to an understanding of paragraph structure, which is something I love to teach. And, and then um, subsequently, or, or at the same time, an understanding of how reading works, which really is what I'm doing all of the time. When I'm teaching creative writing, I'm teaching how reading works. And we all think, I mean, I, at least I, I used to think when I was in my 20s that I knew how reading worked. And and it wasn't until I probably was in my late thirties until I realized I didn't know and that I had to, I had to learn it in a different way all, all over again and or come to terms with it in a different way all over again. And, and that, was, that was delightful if, if um, also a bit frightening. But I think one of, one of the things that helped me was, was reading the authors of the South in the United States. Um, I think good fiction is good manners. And there's a great, there's so much good manners in the people of the South, in the United States. There is there is a system of manners. If you read, for example, Eudora Welty or Flannery O'Connor, you will see a system of manners at work in the prose and a type of tact on behalf of the writer uh, which which never falters unless unless they're failing, I think, in what they're doing. They're in, and it 
it is tact, which is um, an intelligence uh, in the service of whoever whoever you write whoever you're writing about. I also came to understand through teaching that stories, particularly short stories, are told with varying degrees of reluctance. And the novel naturally has a more willing narrator, which makes it, which makes the text longer. They're more willing to go on. Um, also the, the, the novel often begins after, uh, the short story often begins after what happens happens. And the novel begins before what happens happens. And, and a great deal has, has already happened, I know, uh, in, in this book, um, when it begins in October of, of 1985. And yet I feel it's a novel simply because of the scope of it. There was something uh, Gardner once wrote, actually, John Gardner. Um, and he had a, he had a paragraph on, on what good fiction was. Um, and it began with, with his, his saying that it, it does all of the following elegantly, uh, comma, efficiently, and then colon. And I loved that. Before I read anything else, I just loved that he saw elegance and efficiency as being able to work together. And, and it, it might seem sometimes that those two styles, an efficient style and an elegant style, would be opposite. But in, in fact, they're not. And, and part, of, part of the tact, it seems, of, of writing good fiction, the type of fiction I admire, is that just, just enough is said, just enough is, is shown. And, and the, the reader has just enough to carry them along and, and embroider all that's there with their own personal lives, their own imagination, and the lives also that we, we could have had. I think we read with the lives we obviously have, but we also read with the lives we could have had, um, and the lives we might have had, which I, I, I think we, we take all of that to a text when, when we read a text. Um, and that's, that's one of, those are a few of the things I learned by, by teaching people how, how fiction works while I was figuring it out myself, by the way. Claire, Keegan, thank you very much.